Welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be here today with Stephanie Kleba and Jessica Peranfar. And we're going to talk about music therapy and why, as somebody with Parkinson's, you might be able to use music therapy to help you live well with Parkinson's. So Stephanie and Jessica, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into this work? Um, so I started out, uh, so all music therapists have board, uh, are board certified. Um, so after I finished college, did my internship, I did a medical uh, music therapy internship. Um, I got my board certification and I uh, moved up here to the Chicago area to work for Stephanie and uh, got to work with a wide range of populations. Um, while I've been here, I've also gotten my neuro music therapy training. So this means that I'm better able to work with patients who have neuro deficits and one of those is Parkinson's disease. So that's kind of how I got, I got started with that. Let's see. I'm going to go back a little bit just to the, about how I chose music therapy, if that's okay. It's something a little bit different, but um, I started out in um, psychology and then music ed and almost left college for nursing. And so when the guidance counselor knew that I liked all those different areas, he said, have you ever heard of music therapy? And I said, what is that? And that was years ago. So he explained that and it was a combination of everything that I loved, being able to work in the medical field, but uh, using counseling types of skills with patients and helping others, um, but also using music to do that. And that's how I got into the degree, if you will. Um, and um, I guess the rest is history. So I went to, went to Florida State um, and just went to University of Louisville in Kentucky. All okay, right, great. So uh, you gave a, a tiny bit about music therapy, but as somebody with Parkinson's who doesn't really know anything about it, what, what does a music therapist do? What are they and what would it look like? So if you were to ask, what is a music therapist? Probably in a nutshell, my favorite line is, well, it's a degreed board, board certified clinician and musician. That's type, you know, everything in a nutshell, but the group that oversees us and um, looks at our standards of practice and our ethics is called American Music Therapy Association. And their definition of music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic setting. And that's by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. So we're looking at um, a music therapist is somebody that assesses the strengths and the weaknesses or the goals of the client, uh, addresses everything from physical to emotional to cognitive and which is communication as well uh, to social needs of the individual using music interventions, but they translate and transfer then to non-musical goals. Okay, so how can music therapy then help people with Parkinson's? So um, for people who have Parkinson's disease, uh, we use music to achieve goals such as speech, uh, sensory motor, cognitive, memory, and most of the techniques we use are neurologic music therapy techniques. Um, it, it is an evidence-based practice and the techniques are also evidence-based. Um, so some of the things we do, for example, uh, vocal intonation therapy, uh, VIT, um, and that is really just using uh, vocal exercises to um, exercise your, your larynx, um, the respiratory. Um, we do a lot of breathing, uh, lots of warming up, singing. We'll get to some of those exercises later. Um, that's just a little bit of what we do with speech. Um, we do a lot of exercising with music, um, rhythm with music. We'll get to that later as well. Um, so really working on the three main areas are speech, um, motor goals, fine motor and gross motor, and then cognitive skills and memory through music. Okay, so you named some of the specific symptoms that people with Parkinson's face. Can you give me an example of one symptom that's very common and then what you might do um, as an intervention to help it? So like, for example, like the symptoms of Parkinson's, uh, we know that a lot of people who have Parkinson's have bradykinesia or issues with movement, slowed movement, and shuffle of step, um, slowed 
you know, slowed steps and things like that. One of the techniques that Jess had addressed um, through neuro music therapy is rhythmic auditory stimulation. And that works on gait mostly. So when we're when someone's working on moving, walking, and their gait, uh, that is an area that we can use rhythm and cues uh, live to help that person achieve the goal that they're they're looking to achieve and to speed up movement. Um, so, and also when we're talking about other issues of the voice, and Jess had mentioned some of that as well, um, working on breath support and control, uh, there are some like she had mentioned, vocal intonation therapy, almost looks like choir exercises. It's almost like you're, you're warming up and those types of things uh, with choir. So those types of things are very helpful. We're working on um, articulation, vocal range, things like that. So it, I, it's so fascinating to me when I see somebody with Parkinson's who's you know shuffling, they may be able to move, you know, a half an inch at a time their their feet are just barely moving and then music comes on and they're all of a sudden like dancing across the wall like what's what is happening how is that possible um basically there is a natural phenomenon that occurs in your brain called entrainment it's very simple it's basically when you hear music any when any person hears music and you start kind of tapping your foot along or maybe clapping or patting your leg um, that's entrainment. Um, you start to move to the rhythm of the music naturally. And what happens is your, your brain signals um, your muscles that are going to move. So for gait, it would be, you know, your leg muscles, your feet, everything. It signals them to move in between the beat. So your, your muscles actually start to contract right before you're about to take the step. And so that's why rhythm, music, and walking or um, music and movement uh, work really well hand in hand because it's all, it all comes back to the brain. It's all neurologic. When um, they talk about the brain and the processing of rhythm, it's closely tied to the processing of movement. And those areas are, are very closely related in the brain. The rhythm activates the neural circuits, actually, that are involved in motor planning. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to understand. For example, imagine somebody drops something on the ground behind you. We usually startle, right? There's an immediate movement that, like the startle reflex, that's an example of how the two are very closely related. Um, there's a funny YouTube uh, uh, example and um, it's called um, Snowball the Dancing Cockatoo and if you look that up you can see that not only people and humans but animals also can entrain to mm -hmm. music and this is an example of a cockatoo entraining to music naturally so that's kind of fun to watch. We do this naturally it's a natural phenomenon. That's really cool. <laughs> um, so as music therapists, do you typically work one-on-one -on -one or is it more group settings? Well, I think most of what our work is, is group settings just because there's the social aspect which supports each other, but people can work one-on-one -on -one, and we have worked one-on-one -on -one with, with clients in the hospital all the time. And many of them have had Parkinson's and so forth. So I would say both. It just depends. You can work on more individualized goals if you work one-on-one, -on -one, but if you're working on general goals, speech, vocal control, movement, we can work in groups to, to, to accomplish that. And Jess, Jess does a lot of groups, so she's going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay, yeah, great. I think that you know there's probably a lot of people watching that don't have much information about music therapy. And they're already hearing about all these great things that can happen from it. But what should they expect when they walk into a class? I mean, is it an hour class? How is, do you have like a, a sort of a set system that you might work on different things throughout the day, but there's like a warm up and an ending? How does it, how does it flow? Um, so I have a couple different classes. Um, they're both an hour long. Um, if I had it my way, it would be once a week. Um, however, we meet a little bit less than that. 
Um, but it is an hour long. Uh, my Resilient Rhythms group, we work on a lot of goals, the, the ones that we talked about. We work on speech, we work on uh, sensory, motor, uh, cognitive, and all of that. Um, usually uh, what they can expect is there will definitely be some kind of singing. Uh, there will definitely be some instrument play um, with rhythm and then some music and movement. So the class looks and is fun, it's very enjoyable. Um, but what they know and what we know is that it's, it's serving a purpose, we're working on goals. So not only is it fun, um, but they're actually seeing improvements. Um, so generally we start with some breathing exercises and uh, a lot of music therapists, we use a metronome. So it's basically gives you a very steady beat. Um, we do a lot of breathing with that to control the airflow and um, lots of breathing exercises, inhaling, exhaling, um, seeing how, how much we can control the breath and get, get the air moving. Um, and then we'll do some vocal eases, some vocal intonation therapy. We'll work on articulation and also um, We'll, we'll sing with intent. It's always, everything is always done with intention, movement and speech. Um, so we'll work on articulation, uh, projecting the voice and making sure it doesn't fall off at the end of lines or sentences. Um, and I'll give you some examples later. And then after we've sung some, uh, some enjoyable songs uh, that everyone knows and worked on the articulation and the projection and all of that good stuff. Then we'll move on to um, some instruments and we'll um, do some therapeutic drumming. Um, sometimes we'll use a metronome for that as well to get started. And um, that also goes hand in hand with, with movement. So um, a lot of times I'll put them, uh, I'll couple them up and one person will hold the drum and the other person will hold a mallet that's used to hit the drum and they'll hit it in different areas. Um, and that goes along with, uh, with temp, right. um, which is another uh, NMT technique that we use. And um, let's see, we do some dancing as well a little bit with, with scarves, uh, just a lot of movement to get their bodies, their muscles loose and um, get them moving. And that's mostly what I do in my Resilient Rhythms group. I do also have a singing group called Sing Out, and that's part of the Parkinson's Voice Project, which is a, a national group that started in Texas. And after um, these patients have worked with speech um, therapy one-on-one, -on -one, they do uh, speak out and loud crowd. And then the third part of that, uh, when, once they've graduated from that, they get to come to Sing Out. And that class is pretty much an hour of singing, but we do a lot of exercises, a lot of vocal exercises. And singing is a full body exercise. A lot of people don't realize that. So we'll start with some stretching, stretching the body, stretching the face even. And then we'll, uh, we'll do a lot of breathing exercises with the metronome, vocal eases, and then we'll get to the songs. Okay. So here's my objections going off. What about, I can't sing, I cannot play a music, I can't dance. <laughs> you know, I'm assuming those are objections that you might get when you talk to people and say, hey, you should come. And they're just like kind of paralyzed by the idea of having to kind of put themselves out there like that. Mm -hmm. What do you say to people like that? And what are other objections that you, that you run into? I say, don't worry about it. You don't have to be musically inclined. Um, to participate in music therapy. Um, you, it's okay if you're tone deaf, you know, you don't have to be good at singing or even if you used to be good at, at, at singing and maybe you're not anymore, that's perfect, come. Um, it, it's, it's not so much about making beautiful music as it is the purpose behind it. Why are we doing it? Um, you know, if, if people say, oh, but I have terrible wit rhythm, that's okay. Um, it's still serving a purpose and a goal, and we're not here to perform. We're not, we're not here to put on a show. Um, this, this, this is for you. The, that's really the only objection I get. I mean, I don't really get uh, any objections. I would just say um, it's very important for us to educate 
not only the people who come to our groups, but other healthcare providers, um, other staff and uh, caretakers and loved ones as well. Great. Uh, you spoke to this a little bit, but you said that you would like it to be every week, uh, but it's not every week. It's less than that. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of consistency? Is music therapy something that stays with somebody if they, you know, do it a lot? Does it go away immediately? You know, what, what should somebody expect in terms of uh, sustainability of this type of exercise over the long term? I would say with just like with anything else, practicing and exercising every single day, even if it's just a little bit. Um, they've, uh, Dr. Stegmuller has done some research on this of how long the effects last. And after a six, uh, eight week period, uh, they had music therapy once a week for eight weeks. They started seeing some major improvements. After about two months, um, it started to fade away. When they, when they weren't going to the class. So I would say, you know, PD is a degenerative disease. So you definitely have to work on things consistently, uh, consistently exercising, consistently practicing, singing, vocalizing, doing the exercises. And I typically do send home the group members with a little bit of homework, or I do encourage them to do, do some exercises on their own daily um, if they can. That's great. What are some of the most, you know, fun success stories that you've had with people in your in your classes? Uh, one of the one of the one on ones that I can share with you. This is a about swallowing, which is a big issue with Parkinson's too. Um, but we work on needs. So this this client had a need and had dysphagia, trouble swallowing, um, and was going to be put on a feeding tube, which you never want. Um, obviously, unless it's needed. Um, but we started doing the vocal intonation therapy, the exercises, the um, working on highs and lows, and really strengthening the, the larynx and those muscles involved in swallow, but through vocalization. Also made some um, recordings so the client could do that on their own during breakfast, lunch, and dinner because they weren't eating, they were aspirating, and they said it wasn't safe right then for them to be eating. So practiced during breakfast, lunch, dinner um, with a recorded um, session that we recorded and did not have to have a feeding tube. And that is a success, and we know that it does strengthen the same muscles. The sharing of, of uh, there are so many characteristics that are shared by both, uh, you know, swallow and so forth and and singing uh, shared respirations shared muscles that's why it's so important it does transfer um, the success and one working on you know the goals and one do tr it transfers that's great um, before we get into some actual exercises and I'm scared for that, but uh, before we get into that, what, is there any question that I haven't asked that I should have asked? Like what, is there something else that you would like to let our Parkinson's community know about music therapy? Um, I wanted to mention some of the research that this is backed by research. This is evidence-based practice. Um, some of the big researchers um, that have done studies related to music therapy, Parkinson's and so forth. The first one I would mention would be Dr. Michael Tout, spelled T-H-A-U-T. And he's what we would consider the father of neurologic music therapy. And even back in, you know, 30 years ago and so forth, he was working on techniques, studying them, uh, started using the metronome and rhythms to affect movement in the motor centers. And he's kind of the guru and his group has come up with the techniques that are evidence-based, which we now call neurologic music therapy. So he has a lot of, of studies that have shown improved gait, um, not only how fast someone can take steps, but also how far they can go within a certain amount of time and also the stride length. So he's shown some great improvements with gait and many other areas also of neurologic um, 
you know, working with Parkinson's patients as well, movement and things like that, but come up with the techniques that we use. Dr. Stegmuller, which Jessica alluded to a little bit earlier, Elizabeth Stegmuller is at Iowa State University. And she has done a lot of uh, research with swallow and Parkinson's and also with, um, so her, her groups are mostly working on the voice, respiration, that type of thing, um, vocal quality um, through singing. And she's done some singing groups uh, that have, have shown really amazing outcomes, um, improvements in breathing and the amount of um, pressure, the breath pressure as it's released, uh, improved respiratory control, laryngeal and respiratory muscle strength, vocal duration, uh, improved intelligibility of speech, which we know is really important to understand someone, right? Uh, increased vocal intensity, or we're talking intent a lot, um, articulation, uh, vocal range, which is very important as well, and just overall quality of the voice and speech production. So she's done a lot of work a lot uh, with singing and with Parkinson's patients. So those two, I would say, I would look up some of their research if somebody's looking for proof or a better understanding of what's been studied so far and why we do what we do. Uh, we use their, their information to contribute to our techniques and what we do. I love that it's so accessible. You could be bedridden and do this, right? You, there's just, there's kind of no excuse, right? You can sing, you can, I don't know, do exercises with your face. You can do lots of different things. Um, even for, our, you know, we have a lot of community members that can't get out. They can't leave the house. They don't, or they don't have somebody to drive them and they, they can't drive themselves. And so I'm really excited to see some of these things that we can share with them that they can do at home. So uh, can you share a few exercises for people? Sure, absolutely. Um, the first one I want to share is, is very quite simple. Um, it doesn't take too long to do. And um, this exercise helps to um, lift the soft palate, which is in the back of your throat. And um, that muscle is used when you're swallowing. If you swallow you know, your spit right now, you can feel it go, come down. Um, a lot of people with PD, it might already be down. So it, this uh, whole mechanism is kind of shut off. So we want to work on lifting it up, working that muscle. So uh, one easy way of doing that, if, if, I don't know if you want to try it right now, is just make yourself yawn. So taking a nice big inhale through your mouth. And you feel it raise right in the back. And another way you can also do that is <gasps> taking a, a big, you know, inhale like you're surprised <gasps> and you can feel your soft palate rising. Um, I, I like to do this before we get to, to actual vocal exercises, just to, to feel the soft palate and feel that it should be raised when you're, when you're talking and when you're also singing. Um, the next one I wanted to talk about is lip trills um, or some people call it motor boating and um, unpitched it looks like this or sounds like this and basically the way you do that it's it's really for uh, breath support working your breath seeing how far you can you can go with that um, and basically you press your lips together if you want to try it but not too much you press it just enough for air to come through and some people like to pinch the sides of their lips to, to help, but you take a nice deep breath and let it out. And I like to exercise see, seeing, um, I say, how long can you hold that for? Let's see how long can you breathe in and then hold that out for to practice that um, breath support and moving the air. And then the next uh, part of that would be to start it on a pitch. So and then progressing that something like so starting with it unpitched with just air and then progressing it to um, some some tones so putting a pitch to it or a few or just 
something like that. So I would all, always start with uh, lip trills. The next one is uh, glissandos, or I just like to call it scooping. Um, you start on a low note and then scoop all the way up to the top. And then you can practice going up and then back down. So here's an example. Ah. It doesn't have to be too high or too low, just whatever your low and whatever your high is. Practicing scooping up, scooping down, and then doing them uh, both uh, simultaneously or right after the other. Um, and uh, to go along with the glissandos, also I like to do sirens. So just a higher pitch, and seeing how high you can go with that. Um, really just projecting. I like to tell people um, project to the other side of the football field so that they can hear you over there. Um, and another uh, few exercises I like to do are for articulation. Um, so a really fun one uh, to practice the M sound is uh, mama made me mash my M&Ms. Mama made me mash my M&Ms. You can practice speaking it first and then, uh, and then singing it and then even seeing how fast you can do it. So mama made me mash my M&Ms. Just practicing that articulation. Uh, and another good one is just Mame mi momu. And you can change that to any consonant you want. Ta te ti to tu. Sa se si so su. You can start uh, taking it down from there or, or, or pulling it up just to practice the range. So really getting a good range because a lot of uh, persons with PD, um, speech starts to get monotone, uh, kind of stays this, uh, around the same level um, or just becomes quiet and held back. So we want to um, get it out and uh, sing and speak with intention, always thinking about volume, always thinking about articulation, always thinking about these muscles, your lips, uh, the tongue, the teeth, um, making sure you have enough space in your mouth when you're when you're speaking and singing, especially ah, oh, ooh, all of the big vowels, really uh, projecting them. And um, those so, are some of the exercises. That's it. Cool. So when you, um, I can't remember what word you just said, but you said something. Is this also help with facial masking? It's does does music therapy help with that because you're having to, you know, use your you're using your voice so much, does that sort of naturally lend itself to help with facial masking? Changing, changing the affect and, and that people, yeah. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> obviously it does because you're moving, you're mu moving your mouth around quite a bit. Yeah. So um, it has to, you're using it. Your yeah. Do you, do you know if there's any, you know, evidence or research saying that it, it lasts after that or? I haven't particularly seen it. It doesn't mean that it's not out there, um, but not specifically, I haven't seen it. But like I said, um, we do uh, some stretches and that includes facial stretching that I also recommend to do daily. So one of those, um, I like to hold for three seconds and then release. So one of those is raising your eyebrows and then release and then smiling and release, uh, scrunching your nose, and release, opening your mouth really wide, ah, sticking your tongue out, and release. Uh, things like that, frowning, any kind of um, movement in the face, I like to stretch uh, right after we do some, some body stretching as well, um, just to get all of this going, because we are working the, the mouth quite a bit, and um, opening it wide and smiling sometimes. And then the lip trills also, you know, help with that as well. It gets everything loose, loose and ready to go. Right. So what, um, what is good for people to anticipate? This is an hour class of them. You know, like if they were going to go to a group music therapy class, they might go for an hour, 45 minutes or an hour. What do they expect at the end? I mean, are they, really tired, like they should make sure that they don't have something afterwards or do they usually feel fine? Like I'm just, I'm just trying to anticipate what a new person to it might feel like. A lot of times there's more movement too. Um, after the, the vocal warm ups and the singing, a lot of times there's movement as well. Mm -hmm. So 
Or are you finding that they're tired? I'm finding that they're very energetic and, and motivated and ready to, you know, leave and, and finish out the rest of their day, usually. Um, sometimes they make comments like, oh, wow, that was a workout. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Um, but they're having so much fun that they don't really, you don't really realize that you're exercising because you're having a great time. Right. Um, and one thing I think we forgot to mention was um, dopamine. The mood. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you're listening to music and making music, you're releasing endorphins. And dopamine is one of those things that, that you're losing with PD. So um, dopamine, oxytocin, uh, serotonin, uh, prolactin, a bonding hormone when you're creating music with a group of people. So not only do you have that sense of community um, with others who are, are like you and experiencing some of the same things. Things, um, but you're you're getting a, a workout, <laughs> but it's usually not so exhausting that you have to go home and lay down. <laughs> it's just enough to to make you feel good. It helps boost your mood, um, and it motivates you. Great. So for the exercises that you shared today, how often or how many of them would you recommend for people at home to do it? You know, how many times should they do the smile or how many times should they do the scales or, you know, what, what would be a great sort of prescription for that? For daily? Yes. I would say all of it. I would too. Um, yeah. <laughs> if they and can, whenever they can, just whenever they think of it. Whenever they think of it, whenever they can, at least mm -hmm. once a day. Um, Make a list of the, of the different things that, that were mentioned. Yeah, I was thinking I'd actually create a checklist for them. They can print it off and then they could just look at it and say, oh, I'm going to do that one right now. So. Yeah, that would be wonderful. And additionally, um, singing songs, their favorite songs, even, you know, just putting on the radio or putting on their um, records or cassettes or CDs or whatever they use for their music, uh, uh, Spotify, YouTube, um, putting on a song and singing along to it. Um, and folk and thinking about all of those things while they're singing, thinking about articulation, thinking about projecting their voice, because you really have to do it with intention um, to really get something out of it. One of the uses that that we've discussed before, we didn't discuss it yet today, was when people have the shuffling or the freezing of the gait. Um, one thing that they can use would be an earbud just in maybe one ear so they can still hear traffic and so forth. But when they're out, keeping music on that has a good constant rhythm so that then again, the, moder the, the motor centers are firing. It's that continuous movement. So it helps support that continuous movement in the body. So using that as a uh, compensatory types, um, you know, therapy that they can do on their own. So if they're worried about walking into some, you know, walking through the double doors and worrying about freezing, a lot of times people have used the, the earbuds with something rhythmic to keep going and not have that freezing. And it's worked very well for people. So I've seen, I've seen quite a bit of that, you know, and that's a supportive thing they can do on their own. That's great. So not everybody lives where you live, but for those in the area that are watching, how can they find you and learn more about the work that you're doing at your, at your studios? Well, they can find out about our group and what we do through Expressive Healthcare Solutions. That's our group of music therapy. But if they're looking for a music therapist, they can go on the American Music Therapy Association website. So if they Google music therapy, it'll probably come up first. Again, it's American Music Therapy Association, and they, it has a, an area that drops down that find a music therapist. So they can put in the area that they live in. Also, if they're looking for somebody with specific um, qualities, uh, somebody who works with neuro or who work with, works with Parkinson's, a lot of times they can choose music therapists that have the right credentials or backgrounds. So that's a great way to find a music therapist near them. They're welcome to reach out to us through um, our website. They can ask questions. We're glad to answer them or get in touch with them and help them. Uh, and if they can't find somebody near them, maybe we can help um, put them in touch with a music therapist near them too. So there are, there are many things that, that can be done, you know, learning these types of uh, exercises at home, but also just informing yourself about how music affects the brain. 
it's it's key. It, people think it's it's fun and it's silly and it sounds like you know oh that can't be you know therapeutic. Well, it really is, it really is. That's great. Well, I am so grateful to you, Stephanie and Jessica, for being here today. I know our community is going to absolutely love it, and I can't wait to share it with them. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Thank you.